Even amateur chemists have heard of deuterium, the heavy form of hydrogen. Heavy water or D2O is even something you can drink if you trust Nile Red. But why is deuterium, which is used for nuclear fission reactors or even hydrogen bombs, also part of potentially life-saving drugs being sold in the billions? Today we will go through an exquisite science journey. After this video you will understand firstly how we discovered hydrogen has a fat cousin and why its additional neutron and thus heavier mass makes it special. Secondly, what psoriasis is and why new treatments for this debilitating disease are needed. Thirdly, how a pharma company has developed a structurally aesthetic but also clinically transformative deuterium-based drug. And lastly, staying true to the nature of this channel, how that molecule is actually synthesized. We'll start with the microscopic lab rat synthesis, but then also go deep into how chemists optimized this to an epic large-scale process, delivering over 100 kilograms of product at once. Even if you are not a hardcore chemist, you will enjoy learning new science as well as history facts that you can brag about to your friends at the pub. For example, you will learn why 1 plus 2 does not always equal 2 plus 1 in chemistry. You will also learn how deuterium allows companies to create copycats of existing drugs. According to some people, more enhancing their bank accounts rather than enhancing how effective these drugs are in treating patients. I plan on making more videos in the future, so let me know which part of the video you liked most. Deuterium, a hydrogen atom bearing one additional neutron, was first spectroscopically detected in 1931 by Harold Urey, a chemist at Columbia University. Before this discovery, the Lam-Lee investigation of 1913 marked the first recognizable experimental evidence for these so-called isotopes. They performed very precise density measurements of pure water, so kinda what this meme is indicating, but concluded that water does not have a precise mass instead of postulating the existence of potential isotopes. Research into nuclear physics increased over the following two decades and there are some great articles that describe the background behind Yuri's discovery. This one for example contains a beautiful anecdote of Yuri commenting on the discovery of oxygen isotopes where he unknowingly foreshadows his own discovery like in an Inception movie. I will not explain their specific setup or math as just one glimpse at the Balmer equation gave me post-traumatic flashbacks to my physical chemistry spectroscopy lectures. After an adventurous cryogenic distillation of liquid hydrogen to concentrate deuterium, they sent their samples to analysis via Railway Express. Yuri's first approximated abundance of one deuterium in 4500 hydrogens was quite close to the one in 6500. Yuri really had a lasting impact on chemistry. Most notably, he's known for the Miller-Yuri experiment, which transformed our understanding of the potential origin of life. They basically mixed and electrocuted a bunch of inorganic gases and detected amino acid formation, thus highlighting the possibility of natural organic synthesis on primordial Earth. So what makes deuterium special? In the quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator model, zero point energy is proportional to the vibrational frequency, which in turn is inversely proportional to the reduced mass. This means that the ground state energy of a carbon deuterium bond is lower and that generally higher activation energies are required to reach transition states that involve CD bond cleavage. If more energy is needed, the reaction rate is slower. This so-called kinetic isotope effect was already postulated by scientists in 1933, just one year after deuterium's discovery. And physical chemists swiftly created complicated maths to describe things as usual. You can see in this example of an E2 elimination that the deprotonation step is around six times faster for hydrogen than for deuterium. This nuanced reactivity can have several downstream implications once you start putting deuterium into medicines. Look at this. Most drugs are metabolized by enzymes after administration. One way to deploy deuterium is to include it at sites that are prone to oxidation or other metabolic processes. This can result in an improved pharmacokinetic profile and a more durable effect, or in cases of toxic metabolites, make medicines more tolerable that might have unintentionally killed you before having any benefit. There are also some other benefits you can get, but we will not derail the video. There are several deuterated drugs in clinical development, 
But are deuterated compounds identical twins or actually more like cousins? The first marketed deuterated drug, deutetrabenazine, was developed by Teva, a company primarily specializing in generics, and it was approved in 2017 for Huntington's disease. This story is quite funny or sad, however you want to take it. Normal tetrabenazine was already used for Huntington and going generic, meaning intensified competition. However, the inclusion of deuteriums made the proposed deutetrabenazine a new molecular entity requiring clinical testing, but also making it a special snowflake with renewed exclusivity. Knowing what I've just explained, you might think the deuteriums are having some magic effect. But the problem was that Teva did not set up a direct head-to-head -head trial against the non-deuterated form, only against placebo. Comparing the individual placebo trials of the two drugs against each other showed that there's no significant difference in terms of efficacy or adverse events. For example, if you look at the confidence intervals of the motor score improvements in this table, where a lower score is better, you will see they are quite similar. On the other hand, the percentage of patients experiencing adverse events like depression were a bit lower in the clinical trial for deutetrabenazine. Also, the deuterated drug is taken two times a day instead of three, so it has that benefit going for it as well. Whether or not this is due to deuterium having any tangible effect remains unanswered and just a hypothesis. In any case, the new structure and data gave the molecule a clear differentiation and it led to great commercial success with almost $1 billion in yearly sales so far. Let's now introduce the playing field for today, psoriasis. In this disease, an overactive immune system leads to abnormally excessive and rapid skin cell buildup. There are five main types of psoriasis which can be either mild, moderate or severe based on how much body surface area is affected. And plug psoriasis makes up about 90% of cases. Psoriasis is thought to be a genetic disease that is triggered by environmental factors such as infections or heavy drinking. The shocking thing is that 3% of all adults in the US, so 7.5 million people, are estimated to have some form of psoriasis. This means there is a massive disease burden, especially on the moderate to severe cases. Mild cases may get away with topical treatments, but severe cases, so ones where there is more than 10% body surface area affected, rely on oral or injected medications to manage symptoms as there is no cure. This makes moderate to severe psoriasis a steadily growing market worth around $15 billion, leading to a crowded competitive landscape. The majority of drugs are antibodies targeting the tumor necrosis factor alpha or interleukin cytokines to downregulate the immune system. As always, there's a gazillion of individual cellular pathways which I never seem to be able to remember. One way to characterize how effective these drugs are is the PASI 75 score, here after 12 to 16 weeks. This is the percentage of patients that have a 75% or greater reduction in the area and severity of their psoriasis. You can see that these injected antibodies significantly clear the skin in more than two thirds of patients. There's also a small molecule here in green, a premilast. In contrast to antibodies, this PDE4 inhibition mechanism reduces cyclic AMP levels in cells and thus downregulates expression of TNF alpha and interleukins instead of inhibiting them separately. It's an oral drug, so much more convenient than getting injections at the doctor, but it also has less impressive PASI improvements to boast. However, you'll see that Apremilast is blown out of the water in terms of efficacy by this deuterium boy, Ducravacitinib. You already know it's a nice molecule because it looks quite cool and has the cyclopropyl swag as well. Its mechanism of action, inhibition of the kinase enzyme TIC2, impacts various immune responses driven by type 1 interferons and IL-23 that contribute to the pathogenesis of psoriasis. This is a nice example of allosteric inhibition, which you've probably already heard about. The active site of TIC2 is similar to other enzymes of the Janus kinase family to which it belongs, leading to quite some collateral damage if you would bind to that region. Instead, the allosteric inhibition works via binding to a regulatory domain unique to TIC2 only, making the drug's effect very specific. 
Actually, the US FDA applied a class-wide warning to catalytic Janus kinase inhibitors, as patients treated with these drugs showed high risk of heart attacks, cancer and other serious complications. Because ducravacitinib works via allosteric inhibition, it is thought to be safer and was approved in September 2022 by the FDA. Ducravacitinib competes directly with Epremilast, the oral pd 4 inhibitor we've seen on the previous page. It's taken once a day compared to twice a day for Epremilast. Coupled with higher pause improvements, it's expected to gain a strong foothold in the market. BMS, the company which developed the drug, sees a bright future, projecting over 4 billion yearly sales. But as you've seen before, there's fierce competition in immunology. Now that BMS has validated the TIG2 pathway, the clock might be ticking. Very recently, another clinical stage TIG2 inhibitor from Nimbus was acquired by Takeda for a juicy 6 billion. Early data gives a hint as to why this drug could be best in class instead. While the affinity for TIG2 is roughly the same across both, the Nimbus drug is 10,000 times less prone to also bind to other Janus kinases. So even though ducravacitinib had good safety, this compound could have higher selectivity and efficacy without introducing yuck-related toxicities. If the drug could get to POSI 75 improvements in the 60s or 70s in the clinic, also the biologics treatments could face devastating competition. By now you should be eagerly waiting for the explanation to why deuterium would be incorporated in this methyl group of the drug to begin with. I could have created a full video just on the drug discovery process, but in short, the researchers found that using a normal methyl group, which proved to be very important for selectivity, led to a nitrogen demethylation metabolic pathway, creating a primary amide with a free NH2 group. This primary amide was a much less selective drug and occurring in up to 30% proportion, so obviously they wanted to shut down its formation to keep the selectivity high. If you remember our initial lesson on kinetic isotope effect, it will make sense to you that the N-demethylation, which proceeds via CH bond cleavage in the methyl group, is less favored if the methyl group is deuterium substituted. There's another deuterated drug filing coming up in 2023, but this one is far less innovative. It's basically a deuterium copycat of the drug ruxolitinib, which is used in bone marrow cancer and other cases. Feel free to pause and take a read if you're interested. Let's finally start talking real chemistry and look at how they synthesize this beauty. Because I didn't want to spend 20 additional hours on ChemDraw, I will not cover everything in exhaustive detail, but rather primarily leverage the publication in OPRD. We will start with their discovery route in the forward sense, which was used to produce the molecule on gram scale for preclinical investigations. Their first steps consisted of converting this ester starting material, which they noted was quite expensive, to a triazole via stepwise incorporation of nitrogens, which are obviously common motifs in drugs. Then they methylated that triazole, unfortunately with only poor regioselectivity and requiring crystallization to separate the isomers. After nitro reduction, this led to an overall yield of fragment 7 of 27%, which really isn't great for only 5 steps. The next fragment, or core, was based on this pyridazine ring containing two nitrogens. After hydrolysis of the ester, they performed a cool triple chlorination to generate this intermediate, which was coupled with trideutromethylamine. You see the yield is again quite bad due to the high instability of the trichloro species, which funnily enough got worse as they increased the scale. Classic experimental chemistry. Because trideutromethylamine is also expensive, this made the small-scale route quite unattractive for scale-up. We will not cover the structure-activity relationship studies they performed during early research, but notably, it was key to install a pyridazine ring in this position, as opposed to a pyridine ring with only one nitrogen. This really improved pharmacokinetic parameters like lipophilicity and exposure when they then tested it in mice. Merging the fragment and the core, they added base to trigger a nucleophilic aromatic substitution. This is quite regioselective due to electronic effects. Then they used the aryl chloride to introduce the final cyclopropyl amide with palladium as a catalyst. This step also wasn't grand because the final product with all of its nitrogens turned out to strongly chelate and retain the palladium catalyst used in the last step. 
So they performed various aqueous washes, resin treatment and recrystallization to remove most of the palladium. Obviously you don't want palladium in your medicine. So to address this and the high costs, the team wanted to identify a more robust route for commercial supply. They realized that by using the same stepwise approach but changing the sequence, they might be able to ameliorate some of the drawbacks. So instead, they wanted to incorporate the deuteromethyl amide in the final step to save using too much deuterium reagent and to avoid the residual palladium problem of the first generation route. As the penultimate step, they would introduce the cyclopropyl amide and before this couple the fragment and the core together. If you recall the nucleophilic substitution of the aryl chloride just a few moments ago, you will remember that the C4 position was much more reactive than the C6 in that reaction. So it makes sense to leverage this inherent reactivity and have this as the very first CN bond formation out of the three possibilities. Let's start with the core and look at the reactions in more detail. It was created through a nice three-step cyclization sequence and subsequently deoxychlorinated to introduce the aryl chlorides as future coupling handles and hydrolyze to the free acid. The first sequence is super cool and if you're feeling eager you can pause and think about the mechanism for a minute. It starts with a diazo transfer which is very standard. After this the diazo species is reduced, hydrolyzed and finally undergoes acid promoted cyclization on the distal ester to form a six membered ring. The molecule obviously converts into the aromatic structure of the core at the end. Next up was the deoxychlorination with POCl3. This worked well but required significant optimization from the process team as they observed two sets of impurities occurring during the reaction itself as well as during quenching of the reaction mixture. After painstaking investigation and characterization, they described it this way themselves, they figured out the structures and origins of these side products, tracing it back to dimerization and quench instability. The dimers form through intermolecular coupling in over 10% yield, which really was not acceptable. They managed to suppress this to just 2% however, by smartly using LS polar solvent and adding triethylamine as a base. The quench side products arose from high sensitivity to hydrolysis of the chlorides, which you can clearly tell from the structures. The first idea was to go non-aqueous, such as ethanol and triethylamine, but this led to substitution with ethanol instead of water. They also tried to control temperature and time more stringently, which worked out on small scale, but as sometimes happens, did not work anymore after scale up, even though they believed they operated with identical conditions. They hypothesized that the heterogeneous biphasic mixture led to inadequate mixing at local hotspots, which was where most of the hydrolysis was taking place. So what they tried next was to target a homogeneous quench mixture. Switching the solvent to acetonitrile and diluting things a bit, they managed to create a homogeneous solution. Funnily enough, this only worked if they slowly added water to the reaction mixture and not the other way around, as this also led to a heterogeneous mixture. So in some cases, mixture plus water does not equal water plus mixture. It's really something else to see such a large scale procedure using for example 2400 liters of MTBE for the organic extraction. On such dimensions, it also becomes really important to track all details of the process, for example, self-heating, gas release, etc. For the second fragment, you will remember that the first gen process used quite an expensive starting material that was converted to the methylated triazole in various steps with low regioselectivity. In the next gen route, they invented a novel triazole ring formation reaction operating at mild conditions in high yield. This one proceeds via addition of N-methylformohydrazide to a nitrile, which then undergoes further intramolecular cyclization and rearrangement. This allowed them to use a much cheaper starting material. Next, they performed the nitration under standard conditions, which on large scale needs to be very carefully managed. I hope you see why the substitution is very selective for this position. Lastly, they just had to remove the chloride group, which was part of the starting material. Now that we have the core and the fragment optimized, the team looked towards the CN coupling number one, which initially employed lithium HMDS as a base, giving good yield. 
To optimize for a more sustainable solvent and capture hydrochloric acid formed in situ, the team opted for a buffered water system, which also really worked great. This boosted yield further, but they also generated side products originating from different mono or dye substitution, so they also had to tweak the selectivity. They realized that by using Lewis acids, specifically zinc acetate, these side products were contained to under 1% each. As an added bonus, this formed the zinc salt of the product which proved to be much more stable. So really they hit two birds with one stone. This final step gave really high yield and purity, which was also much higher than the 83% yield of the first gen small scale synthesis. Now they turn to the second CN coupling. Again. The chemists had some funny observations during their optimization. Initial conditions worked great on small scale, but upon scale up, their potassium phosphate base had to be very finely jet milled to a small particle size to effect proper conversion. This was quite a pain in the ass. Strikingly, when they increased the excess of the amide coupling partner, the need for this vanished. Rather, they were able to use off the shelf potassium carbonate now. Again, as an added bonus if you will, this difference in inorganic counter ion also led to an improved reaction profile and stability of the product. Talk about random findings. So what's the final step? Exactly, our deuterium. They used the hydrochloride salt of dideuteromethylamine because the free amine is a gas. Obviously you'd rather work with a crystalline salt than a gas, especially on high scale. Then they threw in a combo of coupling agents which affected the amide formation. The standard carbodiamide hydroxybenzotriazole mechanism is maybe something you've already seen. This delivered the final product in 75% yield and over 99.5% purity at scales of over 100 kilograms. Clearly, this was a much better use of the expensive deuterium reagent compared to introducing it earlier in the synthesis. There was also some optimization on this step, which you can read up on your own if you're interested. Wow, what a journey! We've now seen how the ingenuity of the team boosted overall yield to massive 43% over 8 steps. Notably, the use of deuterium reagent was reduced by 80% and the total API cost decreased by more than 50%. In the spirit of sustainability, they also managed to use a lot of water or more sustainable solvents and avoid for example halogenated solvents entirely. For any of you still around, I hope you enjoyed the video and took away some nice insights. Thanks a lot for your support. Let me know any ideas or thoughts in the comments and I'll see you all in the next one.